be one. My name is Lee Jondro with Abundant Grace Fellowship here in Keene, New Hampshire, and I welcome you to uh, this morning's, uh, I guess we call it a broadcast. Uh, so I just want to welcome you again, Lee Jondro, Abundant Grace Fellowship in New Hampshire. And today, I've been thinking about this for a while, so today's message is about <clears throat> something that occurred to me many, many years ago. And so I've been titled that any dead fish can uh, can swim downstream. And people thought that was an interesting title, but I think what 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 I, you're going to see I'm going to come to is a lot of us have decided that we're we're going to go against the grain or we're going to move upstream. You know, if you if you know anything about fish, salmon will swim upstream, whereas many many fish will be just subject to the currents and the ways of life. What's happened to us? collectively in so many cases, and this is not a statement of anarchy, but we've allowed culture to dictate where we're at. Now, we're, we're to reach out into culture and we're to walk with culture, but we're not to participate on the same level as the culture. And so today uh, I'm gonna share a couple of things about it and I'm gonna give you some tips and from the Bible. And, and so, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this so much because I just see people just going through things. So if you're new to our, our, our videos, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself a thinker. I don't just accept the normal way of doing things. I don't think there's one answer for most things. I said yesterday, you know, everybody goes, let your yes be yes and your no's be no's. And, you know, that's good about the context that it was used in, but if you try to apply that to everything in life, you're gonna be disappointed. You know, you can't be black and white in life about everything, and, and, and I learned the hard way. So I'm gonna share some of this this morning, and hopefully you'll gain something out of it. Before I jump into this, I just wanna thank everybody uh, that participated in our, our, our podcast and our video broadcast last week. We, we went, we were um, in person for the first time since March of last year, and it was really good, and it was great if you were one of the people that showed up. I'm, I'm grateful that you were there. It was great to see some faces that we haven't seen in a while. It was, you know, I think it's part and parcel who, who we're called to be. So many, many years ago, I had this friend, Daryl, and I had invited him in to, uh, <clears throat> we were going to do a leadership conference together. And we rented the local hotel conference room and everything. And we had all these leaders from around New England. We're, we're, we're going to come into uh, where I live, Springfield. And so what happened was there was a big snowstorm coming in. So my friend Daryl and his wife, Martha, they flew into Manchester Airport. And I made it over there. But on the way back, the snow just kept packing up and it was turning to ice. And by the time we got to the, the highway that went through the town where I live, the, the, the snow and ice was like stacked this much. They weren't even plowing it because it was wet, and it was frozen and, you know, all that stuff. And it wiped out a lot of power lines. And my friend, you know, Daryl and I, we talked and I said, you know, we were getting calls and we don't know if we're going to make it. We can't make it. And I looked at Daryl and he said, buddy, we're leaders. We're going to lead. So we went down to the conference and they had no lights and everything. And there was people that showed up despite the, 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 the conditions. The sun had come out, but the roads still had like four or five, six inches of ice on them. And people were slow to get there and things, but they showed up and people go, oh, should we do this? And we looked at each other and he looked at the people that were there and he said, we're leaders. We always find solutions to the situations that occur. And I'm the first one to say that I do not believe every solution that we find leads to the solution of the problem. Sometimes our solution needs to be that we need to create a new model. So <clears throat> what came out in that, he began to share this story. He was from the mid. Uh, Upper West, uh, you know, he lived up in uh, Washington State, and he was talking about salmon and things like that. And he says salmon will go through craziness to get to where they need to be to bring, you know, plant their seed, you know, plant their seed and make ready for another generation. 
And he said, lots of fish just get washed down in the rushing water. <clears throat> and this is, that's where that line came from. Any dead fish can swim downstream. Uh, you don't need a life to go with the flow. That's my part. His part was any dead fish can swim downstream. I'm telling you, you don't need a life to act like the culture. You don't need a life to be counterculture, if you will. Again, not a statement of anarchy. Just simply saying we live in the world, but we're not of the world. We bring, we bring as, as believers, we bring as people who are born in the image of God, we bring to the table great and mighty power. And, and we see situations occurring. I've been watching this series on anxiety. Um, it's part of a 35-day plan I've been working on. It's a video video courses. It's free. If you if you suffer with anxiety, uh, you may want to reach out to me. Uh, it's not just you know. I learned a long time ago. I believe God for for everything, and I've seen people instantly and immediately delivered from anxiety. But what do you do about the things that aren't like anxiety disorder or you know requiring medication? What do you do about the ones that? on a daily basis or a weekly basis, they come up, you know, how many people, you know, how many people didn't know what their paycheck was going to look like, or maybe they were a salesperson on commission and they got anxiety waiting to see what was going to appear in their check. And, and how do you counter that? And, and I look at that. And for me, I counter a lot of things with the Bible. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with all prayer and supplication. Okay. That's my biblical answer. And that works for me much of the time. But I also have things where I have to flip the script, if you will, and, and, <clears throat> and work against that. So when people tell me, ah, I'm just in it for the ride, I'm just along for the ride, I'm like, I can't do that. You know, so you and I do not live or do not have to live the life of a dead fish. You and I are in the river of God. Um, you know, the first time the river of God, if you will, was mentioned was in the book of Genesis. It said the river flowed out of Eden and, and it came out of Eden and, and it had four fountainheads. And you can look that up on your own. Uh, the scripture that I want to share with you is from Psalm 65, verse 9. It says, you care for the land and you water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain for so you have ordained it. We who are believing, we who have discovered our identity or are in the process of discovering our identity, because, because our walk is a process, it's a journey, you know, it's not one and done, it's a process. As much as we hate to believe that, it's a process. You know, I would love to miraculously accumulate two miles under my belt every day without ever leaving my couch. But it's not, a, it's not a reality. So I have to engage in the process. And so I, I, I looked at this scripture because I was thinking about the river of God. And I looked and it said, it said that uh, I or you, and the scripture says you enrich it abundantly. And I'm like, that is my calling to enrich where I live, who I'm about abundantly, to bring, to bring grace and to bring love continued on in that verse, it says, the streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. How many of us have heard that, you know, we're to provide seed to the sower or cast your cares upon, you know, cast your cares upon the waters and like bread, they will return to you. You know, that that's where I, where I think the river of God, it says all streams, you know, come into the river of God. All, all denominations, all non-denominations, all, all people have a different experience in God, a different calling, a different identity. But we come together and we're to enrich it abundantly. You know, if salmon didn't make it all the way up the stream or the river, the river and then ultimately the stream to where they, where, you know, where they spawn, there would never be another generation of uh, salmon. And so for us to bring goodness to another generation, we need to live from an abundant place of what we have. You know, we have to have that abundant life, that Zoe life, that teeming life, you know, 
uh, you know, there's a, there's a song that came out in the 90s from Vineyard. And, you know, the river of God is teeming with life. I think it was an Andy Park song, just if you're looking it up. Um, you know, for me, I grew up, my dad was a fisherman, my mom fished. You know, our family fished, whether it was on the lake, whether it was in rivers or streams, or whether it was on the ocean where we lived. We fished. And I've seen my share of dead fish. And I've been around the kingdom of God long enough to see that there are people that are deceived into thinking that their existence is over. They, they're not going to live. I believe in healing, but I'm racing to the doctor and I'm just going to live on meds the rest of my life. You know, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to the doctor. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with medicine. We, we can turn it around. We can say, you know, this is all I have. I'm going to live on what I get. And, and, and I'm just going to, I'm going to hoard it. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to give. I, I think one of the greatest deceptions is not giving, you know, not, not just giving to Abundant Grace Fellowship. And we appreciate it. And for those of you who are visiting, if you're interested in giving to us ever, tithely, you can, you can see the, the link to it. You can send checks, whatever, please don't send cash. Um, unless it's quarters, because I understand there's a shortage of that more and more. So I learned to fish and I was a good fisher, fisherman. And so when I came into the kingdom of God and I saw that, you know, Jesus is calling us to be fishers of men, you know, he says it to the disciples, but, but he's saying that to you and me because the life of Christ is existent now, just as it was then. And so I want to be a fisher of men. And, and I've gone through a great morphing on what that means. But I think one of the things that I want to see in the abundance of the life that I have is I want to have happiness. Now, I understand that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. You can see that in the scriptures. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's, that's where we live. We don't have to live like that. You know, the culture of the kingdom or the culture of heaven is existent in us, but that doesn't mean we have to live like it. But when we don't live like it, we lose out on the happiness. We lose out on the, the, the things that are tied to it. You know, a few weeks ago, I've uh, been praying about sending out prayer claws to people and making them available. And one of the, the ladies in our, our fellowship made a whole bunch of uh, prayer claws. So if you're watching us and you want a prayer claw sent to to you, you can just hit the message button and you can give us an address and we're more than willing to do it. There's, there's no charge for that. You know, it's, it, it's one more thing it comes from the scriptures where, you know, Paul was walking down and people had their handkerchiefs, and, you know, prayed over these things and they were brought back to people and they were put in their beds and their pillows and whatever they had. And it brought healing, just like the shadow that would pass over. You know, as my friend Brian Simmons said the other day, that, you know, the shadow, you know, the belief that the shadow became like the nuclear bomb of healing, um, you know, we can live for that. So the other day, as part of my <clears throat> changing how I think on some levels, adding some things to my life, adding value to my own walk, that kind of thing. I encountered this uh, story that I had heard before. I never, I couldn't have told you where it came from. And uh, this guy was sharing. He said, so imagine you have a cup of coffee. I, I would imagine that some of you who are watching this have a cup of coffee. And he said, imagine you have a cup of coffee. And your enemy walks by. And your enemy pours sugar into your coffee. What would the result be? The result would be that it would be sweet, you know? And then he said, well, imagine if your friend was walking by and he had some strychnine and he accidentally dumped it into your cup of coffee. And what would the result be? And of course, the result would be that they would be sick and dying. And so he said, it's not about what's added to the coffee. It's about watching your cup. And I went, even though I had heard that story many, many times in my life, for some reason, it's, it, it just grabbed me. Watch my cup. I am the vessel that God has made. I have a re requisite or a requirement upon me to watch myself. 
I'm not looking. About, I'm not talking about watch everything I do and make sure I don't make any mistakes. That's good and good. But sometimes good is the enemy of God. You know, the, 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 the things that were problematic for me when I lay on my bed and I behold the Lamb of God, I believe that the more I behold the Lamb of God and I put my eyes upon Him and I, and I believe and I, and, I, and I visualize God's encompassment about me in everything that I'm doing, those things that have betrayed me, not people, but, but those things that have caused me to stumble and to fall, and, you know, just in the last couple of days, I had a situation where I found myself thinking, Lee, how dumb are you? And, you know, I'm trying to flip that script, you know, trying to change everything in my mind to flip that script. So my default isn't Lee, you're an idiot. So I've been thinking about this cup and I've been thinking about, you know, I want to watch my cup. It's not like I'm fearful that someone's going to put sugar or strychnine, or, you know. But I mean, you know, years ago we we did a teaching, which is is still very popular, and I think there's a reality to it about watching the eye gate, watching the ear gate, make sure you know what's coming into your life. But but sometimes people get caught up in the fear mode of that, and they they, they struggle to be around people. Jesus didn't avoid toxic people, and and I've told people in my life, I'm not going to avoid toxic people. I'm going to keep my times shorter. You know, I'm going to allow my boundaries to change a little bit, but I'm not going to avoid toxic people because I don't think that's godly. And, you know, and it's an old uh, Pentecostal person said to me, he goes, Lee, how are you ever going to change them if you're not close to them? And, and I, I believe that. And so today I want to talk about watching our cup, watching what we put, if you will, or, or allowing to come into our life. This isn't a religious teaching. This isn't a uh, legalistic teaching. That's not where I live. All these things happen because of grace. Because of grace, I get to have an abundant life. Because I have an abundant life, I can spill out into others' lives. And, and that's what I believe. So I'm going to jump right into this. I, I'm probably going to keep this a little shorter than normal. I've, I've been thinking about some things related to that. So the first one I want to talk about is face your fears. Face your fears. And the second I said that, there, some of you might have rolled your eyes. Some of you went, you know what? Time for me to go to the bathroom. I'm not sure I want to hear this. But, you know, if, if I don't face my fears, if I don't know where I stand in something, um, if I try to dismiss them or, and I don't face them, uh, I'm going to struggle. Because it's always going to be the boogeyman right outside my door. And so, you know, I started to think, what, what, is, what is the one thing that I'm most afraid of? And for you, it may not be a big deal. But for me, it's a huge big deal. It's not about getting on or off an airplane. It's not about being concerned about people coming to my house or waking up in the middle of the night. No, no, it's not. not. It's about making a phone call. Now, people who know me know I've been in sales and marketing for many, many years and, and, and things. And so this week, this coming week, I am going to deal with, with that problem for me. That's my greatest thing. It's not even, you know, like it, it, it's about being in a circumstance that seems to be beyond my control. So that's my fear factor. Um, and so... Part of this teaching, if you will, has come out of this from a biblical place. And so I want to share Isaiah 40, 31. It says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wigs as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Many, many years ago, Bob Jones said to me, he said, he said, I want you to see yourself in a heavenly place. Far above, this is scriptural, far above principalities, powers, and rulers of air. So they can't get a hook in you. You know, Jesus said that the devil doesn't have a hook in him. There's nothing to hook to. You know, I want to see myself as Teflon, Teflon to the enemy's, you know, tricks. So I, 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 Isaiah 40, 31 is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. It meant more to me in my early days than maybe it means now because I have scriptures that have to do more with my journey and where I'm at. But 
they will rise up on uh, on the wings of eagles you know i you know there's a renewing of strength you know the bible tells us that in our weakness he is made strong but that doesn't mean we can be we have to be without strength that doesn't mean we can't swim up the stream to get where we need to go it doesn't mean we just have to give up and down down the river we go um the second the second verse is in second corinthians 14 17 through 18 for our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all so we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen for what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal fear is a temporary thing i'm not talking like your life is a whisper i'm talking about like whatever it is you're fearful of it's a temporary thing we don't have to live in that fear place you know bible tells us that perfect love casts out fear it tells us that we have not the spirit of fear but that of power of sound mind and of love and and i think we need to key into the love i think we need to work on embracing the perfect love of god you know the perfect love that's here the perfect love that envelopes us the perfect love that moves through us John 13, 16 says, this is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us, so we should give our life for our brothers and sisters. Suppose someone has enough to live and sees a brother or sister in need, but does not help. Then God's love is not living in that person. My, my children, we should love people not only with words and talk, but by our actions and true caring. Okay? One of the ways to overcome fear is to move in an opposite spirit. You know, many, many years ago, my friend Keith said to me, he goes, Lee, we need to move in an opposite spirit. If we're being, if we're being pushed by hoarding people or greedy people or it's manifesting in our own lives, we need to work in the spirit that is godly, that moves against greed, that moves against the spirit of hoarding in things so we need to approach our fear the next one is we need to exercise our will to change our direction you know we don't have to be the dead fish swimming downstream you know rolling downstream you know we don't have to keep on doing what we've been doing for all these years if it's not yielding benefits now, if the Lord has clearly spoken, I want to be very clear about this. If the Lord has clearly spoken to you that you're not to make a change, don't make a change. But if you're using that to play the God card, so you don't have to hear what's being said when God's talking to you through what I'm going to say, then then stop playing that game. Okay? It's not If it's not yielding the benefits, maybe you need to pick a new destination. Maybe you need to pick a new place to be. And the good news is God has given you and I free will to make decisions because even in the Declaration of Independence, it tells us to, to, to what? The pursuit of happiness. It's, not, it, it's a journey. It's a step. It's a process. It's a progress towards happiness. And we can clean up those errors. We can remember that the blood was more than enough. We can take communion and be reminded of the goodness of God. And, and we're going to take communion at the end of this. And we can make a difference. Romans 8.37 says, But in, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. King James says, you know, that we are more than overcomers through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. You know, Christ Jesus is the life that, that the, the, the Zoe life, the abundance of God is blazing through you. And the, the, the only question is, will you exercise it? Will you allow it to move? In a direction that that changes things about you, you know, you know, and and it's tied it's tied to fear. Sometimes I'm afraid, you know. I always wanted to start my own business, but I'm really afraid. Number one, so I gave you the tips. But now you come to that place. What are you going to do to change your you know change your approach? <clears throat> the next one is admit your mistakes. The New Living Translation says in James 5, 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. What if a lot of the healing that's going on is we're afraid to have that conversation, that confession of mistake or confession of sinfulness? 
You know, people have taken the whole Catholic Church of going to confession, and they've thrown that out. But then you, but you can't avoid this scripture. You can't avoid this scripture. The, the book of James, very first book that was written in the New Testament. I know it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. The book of James is the very first book. They, they, they understood the part of healing sometimes is getting rid of the stuff that binds you, that holds you back, that confines you, the fears that you haven't spoken. Many, many years ago, I was in a 12-step program, some 30 years ago, and, and one of the women said to me, she goes, a problem shared is a problem halved. So when I look at confession, I see it as a problem shared is a problem halved. We begin to, you know, make a change and, 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 and do something with it. You know, the ability to say, I'm sorry. Forgiveness is a hallmark of Christianity. Those that don't forgive are working in an anti-Christian sentiment. I'm not saying they're the antichrist, but I don't know what you would do with the scriptures and, and you know, back in the, the later the later books of John where he says there's many antichrists that move amongst you. Um, you know, you don't have to tell everyone, but you probably need to tell someone. You know, and, and, and the reason is because it sets us a, 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 a bedrock of where you and or I might be at when I when I you know when 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 I shed that and share that and allow them to pray healing comes into my mind healing comes into my emotions life begins to be restored I'm not just tumbling down the streams of life but I'm beginning to walk in the goodness of God and the abundance that He has for me. <clears throat> Sometimes the next one is about changing your goals. You know, if, if you've reached that comfort zone and, and you know, is, is, as for all the millions of teachings out there that talk about not staying in a comfort zone, that's kind of where life is. You know, that's part of the journey is to step out of that comfort zone. Not because, you know, I'm not telling you to give away your house you know, to get out of the comfort of owning your home. But sometimes we need to get out of the way of what we're doing. You know, if we find ourselves tumbling down the stream of life, you know, in the deadness that we're allowing to take away from us. And comfort zones can can bring about a deadness in our life, you know. And then, you know, and then unfortunately, you know, they talk about midlife crisis. But, you know, what if midlife crisis is, is, is in part, I'm not saying the phenomenon isn't real. But what if it's in part, you know, we become comfortable, we become comfortable with our relationships, we become comfortable with our workplace and all those things. What I'm saying is that sometimes we need to give um, a change. Philippians 3.13 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Jesus has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, regardless of your belief about where we go or whether it's where we go to heaven or we, 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 we bring heaven into where we live, which for the record is more where I live, um, I believe we can live heavenly every day. I'm not saying it won't be without trials, and I'm not saying there won't be tribulations, but I'm saying that, you know, sometimes we need to push ourselves. You know, this week I'm going to push myself about the whole call, cold calling thing. And, you know, it's different when somebody calls me because, you know, now I'm in control. But it's the flip side of that is when you have to call into something. So refine, refine what you're doing. Hebrews Three says, and to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest? Was it not those who disobeyed? So we see that because of their unbelief, that they were unable to enter. That por that that portion of scripture in uh, the book of Hebrews goes on to say, you know, you know, first they could not enter the rest because they did not mix their faith with the promise. Faith is, you know, not a, not utilizing our faith. You know, I can be comfortable where I am and I can trust that God has my back, my front, everything around me. But but I still think there's a part 
that, you know, I, I still think there's this thing about pioneering. I think that there's pioneering that needs to go on. 66 years old this summer, just took on a, a partnership with a friend of mine, going out and making a difference in business. You know, I have my existing business that deals with positive news and a nonprofit that promotes positivity and positive education. You know, obviously I'm here with Abundant Grace Fellowship and it's not, I, I want to be very clear. I'm not looking for something more exciting. I'm not looking to be uncomfortable just to say I existed outside my comfort zone. But I do think that as the Lord moves on, it's not that he'll leave us or forsake us, okay? He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. But I think there's something as the Lord moves that we need to follow, that he has a journey set up for you and me. And 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 part of that journey is is our walk, that, you know, we would, we would change where we're going sometimes. And sometimes we have to add a new goal, you know, whether it's, I haven't exercised in two years, so I'm going to go exercise five minutes, five minutes. It's incremental. Your brain doesn't know that it's five minutes. Your brain doesn't know if it's five minutes or two days. What it knows is today, that was your goal. And today you've accomplished that incremental. It's not about baby steps, it's about steps. That baby step thing that reduces everything so often to stupidity and, and, and treats people like they're not worthy. You know, we take steps. You know, if you've ever been in a place where, you know, people have been injured or have had back injuries or possibly even paralysis or they're working through PT, PT is moving people past their comfort zone. PT is helping them pursue a goal of getting a restoration of life back into their, you know, their, their legs, their arms, their bones, their body, whatever it is. And, and, and we need to see that in the body of Christ, just as I'm talking about a body of Christ that sometimes goes through hindrance, you know, where, you know, even as far reaching as paralysis and things like that. There's always the miraculous holdout in that. But in the body of Christ, there are, you know, there's always going to be people who are going to be a little slow on the take up. I'm not saying they're dumb. I'm saying they're slow on the take up. They're not ready to embrace something. But, and there's others that want to jump ahead. And, you know, and I, and I shared what I shared a couple last week or two weeks ago about, you know, crossing over was last week, but before that about why we need to gather. And, and so we're there, you know, the body of Christ needs to not be the dead fish tumbling down the stream of life, but it needs to be the life that, that goes against the flow, not just to be an anarchist, because that's what people think or where I'm at on some things. No, but it's like, if, if, if they could raise the dead, what can we do? How do we do that? You know, I don't need 15 teachings on raising the dead. I just need to know we can do it. And then I need to find some dead to raise. The next one is believing in yourself. You've got to believe in the possibilities. You've got to believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today. And that comes with believing in yourself. This is not something that you can't learn. It's not a discipline you can't begin to apply to your life. You know, if I have one word to people who have made mistakes and I'm the king of mistakes, you know, I well, maybe I should flip that script. <laughs> I make mistakes because I'm not unwilling to, to push into something. And I know it. I, I absolutely know it. And, and you know, but I, but I know I can learn how to change that. And, and, and it comes with believing in myself. You know, somebody said, you know, give yourself a high five when you walk into the bathroom. Not when you come out. No, when you walk in. I'm just kidding. When you walk into the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror and give yourself a high five. And I went, that is so, I better try that. Especially when I just made a mistake in the last 48 hours. It wasn't a huge mistake and nobody really knows about it but me. It wasn't like terrible or moral or anything like that. But it was one that my, my response was, Lee, you're so dumb. I have to believe in myself. And so I've begun, not just with my affirmations afresh, but I've been begun putting some scripture to it. 
2 Corinthians 1 9. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians, uh, Proverbs 3.26, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. One of my affirmations over myself is I am confident. I am confident. I know where my strength comes from. I am confident. The uh, next one is Proverbs 3.5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways and he will guide you on the right paths. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I, I'm not puffed up when I say I'm confident. I'm not being arrogant. I know who he made me to be. And I walk in that. It says you're, you're, you're an unusual or you're a peculiar people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, kings, kings over life. Here's a biggie. <clears throat> the next one is ask for wisdom. You know, ask for wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If somebody tries to give you wisdom and they're finding fault with you, they're not practicing the principles of the kingdom. The goal, uh, how do I say this? A loving father loves us no matter what. Yesterday I took a picture, I, I wrote this little sign. It said, I'm proud of you. I took a picture of myself holding it, and I sent it out to a couple of people. One of them being my grandson. I'm proud of him. He's making changes. He's making life changes. But there's others that I'm proud of. So maybe you need to make a sign. You know, it was on an eight and a half by 11. You know, just, I am proud of you. in my, you know, big black marker. And I went like this. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. And if no one said anything to you today, I love you. If you're watching this, I love you because he loved me. That's not just some thing I say. If no one else has said, I love you, I love you today. I love you for who the Lord made you to be. I'm not worried about your mistakes. I'm not worried about your sinfulness. I'm not worried about the things that you've messed up. You know, maybe you got up, you went to make coffee, you went to put sugar in it, you put salt in it. I'm not that guy because Christ treated me with kindness and I'm going to treat people with kindness. Tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. So I'm going to speak love over you. And, you know, wisdom comes from God and God alone. Uh, Proverbs 2 says, all wisdom comes from the Lord and so do common sense and understanding. So why don't we have common sense? Okay, I, I you know, you know, everybody knows me. I, I'm, you know, I'm that generation. You know, my generation says common sense isn't so common. Because we've taught people they're either right or wrong, black or white, and I understand that. But in life, life isn't always black and white. You know, without getting into the details of things, there's a lot of people in my generation who believe X, whatever X is. And then they had a child who began to do the opposite of X, whatever X is. Okay, whatever. Doesn't matter what it is. And they had to soften their position or they, or what? Well, well, in the beginning, many of them didn't soften their position. And all of a sudden they looked around and went, where are my children? Well, we don't know. They're not talking to us anymore. Okay. I'm not telling you to soften your position. Hear what I'm going to say. But then they swung over to the other side, way over here. Oh, it doesn't matter what Johnny does. Well, it does matter what Johnny does. But if you're not, if you can't love them through the process, you'll never be able to help them with wisdom. Because if your wisdom, your wisdom in quotes, comes at them and looks like an attack, you're not loving them and giving them wisdom as the Lord gave them wisdom. And anybody can do that. Any dead fish can swim downstream. But it takes that abundant life to come out of you and I to say, you know what? I'm going to confront. And the second I say confront, everybody goes, that's right. You know, tell them the truth in love. And then, you know, you see them come along like John the Baptist, you know, their heads missing. Yeah, that's not truth in love, guys. 
if you have to tell somebody you're going to tell them the truth and love, you've already missed the train. So wisdom, ask for it. What is it you need to change? How do you need to change it? You know, what is it you need to do? You know, there's people that have godly wisdom. And I really, really mean that. But a lot of times, because of the way they present their, in quotes, godly wisdom, they lose out on people. If, if you're conservative and you can't talk to a liberal or you're a liberal and you can't talk to a conservative, wow. Wow. You know, if you, if you consider yourself a spirit-filled Christian and you can't talk to someone who says they're a witch, wow. If a witch can't talk to a Christian, you got to understand those come from experience. Any dead fish can swim downstream. But abundant life says we're going to make the change. Make the change. So ask for wisdom. And I can give you a, a bunch of other scriptures. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll read this one to you. Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Okay. Um, yeah, God wants you to ask for wisdom. You know, if you're running along on your own, you know, a lot, a lot of the, you know, floating downstream like a dead fish, comes from not being willing to just ask God, what would you have me to do? You know, conserve your time. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, as, as I get older, you know, I've had friends and family members that have passed away. And, and a lot of people Say, you know, I have 20 more years or I have this. And, and I don't even say that stuff. You know, I believe life is eternal. And I have my own thinking about that. And I can find it in scripture and I believe it. But a lot of people say I have 20 more years. But what they're really saying is I have 20 more experiences. And so it's really important that we deal with what we have. You know? Don't let life fake you out. Take advantage of what you have today. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy, his name's David Brannard. And he says, be careful to make a good improvement of precious time. Rick Warren says, time is your most precious gift because you only have a set amount of it. Now, he and I would disagree. But regardless of your belief, you only get so much time. Your children are only going to be small for so long. And, 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 I, and I value Rick Warren, by the way. His son committed suicide a number of years ago. And I, I, can't, even, I can't even imagine the pain. Charles Spurgeon said, Serve God by doing common actions in a heavenly spirit. Do not be unwise, but wise. Oh, sorry, I jumped. Uh, if your daily calling only leaves you. Okay, let me read that again. Serve God by doing common actions in a heavenly spirit. And then if your daily calling only leaves you cracks and crevices of time, fill them up with holy service. Now, I don't want you to do something just to be holy in that sense. You know, it's not about legalism. But if you're just scrolling Facebook, maybe you need to stop scrolling and you need to start scrolling. You know, maybe you need to go take a walk. Maybe you need to go visit somebody. You know, the other night uh, we had we had somebody in our, our fellowship who had <clears throat> surgery. You know, we just stopped by to say hi. Hey, we value you. And uh, you know, sometimes you need to scroll. Uh, scroll. Ephesians five fifteen says this. So then, be careful how you live. Do not be unwise, but wise, making the best use of your time, because the times are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Second, Col uh, second Colossians, Colossians 4, 5 says, behave wisely towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. <clears throat> so make sure you take care of time. The next one is, and I'm going to use the word, uh, <clears throat> invest your profits. You know, uh, you know, in the financial world, when we make something on something, we could spend it and deplete it. Or we could utilize that to do something greater. 
Ecclesiastes says, ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Who saw COVID coming? Oh, I know. There's going to be a hundred prophetic voices out there. You know what? If you do the coin toss, the coin flip, I'm just not there. You know, first of all, you know, my, my wife would tell you she lives with this prophetic voice. There are things that I see, things that I know. You know, I could walk into a room full of people. I could write down, you know, the next five years of their life with no exaggeration. But what if it's bad? Why would I share that information with them? To prepare them? We ought to live today for today. You know, we ought to teach people to live today for today. I love events, but I'm not the event guy. You know, I don't want people living for the next great event. I, I never, you know, well, I won't say never, but for many years, I've never understood. I'm taking a vacation because I need a vacation. I don't understand that. Well, you know what? I'm going to honor what I said. I'm going to stop there. We're going to continue this next week. Um, next week, the one we're going to begin with is going to be living with intensity. I said I was going to keep this shorter, and I'm going to adhere to that. It's not as short as I wanted, but I went further than I thought without realizing that. Uh, but I want to honor you. So we're going to take communion. If you follow us, you may already have your, your bread, your cracker, your wine, your juice all ready to go. But I'm doing this because I believe not only does it help me, but I believe that it reminds people that when we do this, when we do this publicly, we're making, you know, we're making a prophetic declarative statement to the work of the enemy. That this is the body of Christ. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, this is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. This bread represents the body that bore 39 stripes, that healing. So I, I believe that healing is in your house. And in like fashion, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that signifies a new covenant. <clears throat> and so today we take that cup and we toast, if you will. To the new covenant, to the goodness of God that comes about us and embraces us. And so I drink to your good health. I drink, you know, that's found in the body. I drink that you would not be that fish that stumbles downstream, just going over rock and rill because you haven't figured out how to make an effort. We haven't figured out how to make a change. Take these things that I said today and meditate upon them. Believe God for the goodness. So I take this cup and I drink to the new covenant. And so that's where we're going to close. Next week, we're going to talk about living with intensity. Living with, you know, intentional living. How are we going to live intentional? The title will still be the same. Any dead fish can swim downstream. So, so look for it. Follow us on Facebook. Abundant Grace Fellowship, you can follow us. I put it up, you know, by Wednesday, I'll have the rest of it up. You'll be able to click, you'll be able to, you know, say, you know, you want to go, whatever it is. I love you. Again, as I said, if no one's told you they love you today, I love you. God bless you. Have a great week.